Good afternoon. How's everybody? Doing well. I can hear it from the, the great conversation. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hoffman, and I have the pleasure of being your club president. Welcome to our 568th meeting of distinguished speakers of the Economic Club of Florida. If you please silence your cell phones so our program is not interrupted. And now, I want to ask my two favorite Marines if they would please stand and lead the pledge. Ken Lawson, my childhood friend, and Steve Llewellyn, another childhood friend. Great Marines. Steve, come to the podium, please. Okay. It's like elementary school. You know it. Go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great job. Same here, brother. All right. Go USA. You know it Again, welcome. We have an exciting program today. Today's speaker is the Honorable Tom Grady. That's even better than the football player, Brady, <laughs> who'll be presenting on Kids, Crypto, Bank, and Excellence. Our very own past chair, Barney Bishop, is here today, and he will be introducing the Honorable Tom Grady in just a few moments. And now, some information for our upcoming program in June. On Tuesday, June 6, again here at the FSU Alumni Center, we are honored to have Miss Katie Yader, president of the Florida Chamber Safety Council. June is safety month, so this will be certainly be a timely discussion. Katie's focus will be on why Florida's business leaders are making Florida the safest, healthiest, and most sustainable state in America. Katie's not only a great leader, but a triathlete, and she's here today. So Katie, would you stand? Because you're one of our special guests. Just a reminder to visit the Economic Club of Florida's website. We have all things Economic Club related. You can also find links to your club's YouTube page and links to podcasts. So if you miss a program, you can go back and watch it. And we are also on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And now I would like to recognize our trustee members. These members of our club provide additional financial support in turn, our trustees receive exclusive benefits, such as attending receptions with our speakers to meet them one-on-one. -on -one. Today, our trustees got to meet our speaker, Tom Grady, and ask him questions. So now, if you're a trustee, would you please stand so we can properly recognize you? And again, I know we have a number of guests, and um, I'm going to go table by table. We're going to start again. And um, Karen, you want to represent? Well, Katie Yeager was just recognized a minute ago, but I'll give you another one. She's not a Tom fan. She's an Iron Woman. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Any more guests at this table? Ken? Excellent. Thank you. And over here. Dominic, would you rep re Dominic, would you, um, Ken Lawson, will you say a little bit about Ken, please? Hi, I'm Ken Lawson right here. <laughs> he did it on your own. I did. I did. <laughs> No. And as you know, Ken served in many capacities in state government. So we're really glad to have Ken. Any more guests at this table? No? Gentlemen, this table? Raise your hand if you have a guest. Okay. Let's start. Thank you. Steve? Very good. Chris?
Chris? Yes, please. Yay. Very good. Thank you. Liza? Thank you. Okay, and Travis, would you introduce our guest together, Ramon, please? <laughs> Ramon and I have been friends for 35 years. He is a distinguished, distinguished lobbyist, and he's from Miami, but he's lived in Leon County for a long time. We're so glad you're here. Okay, I think that does it. And again, we welcome guests. If you would like to join the club, we welcome you. There's information out front. So now let me briefly introduce the head table, and we're gonna jump right into the speaker. Beginning on my far right, your left, we have Karen Moore. Karen is the CEO and founder of Moore, the largest public affairs and public relations firm in the Southeast and one of the top 100 in the world. She's an Amazon best-selling author and is known as the Grand Dame of Public Affairs in Florida. Next month, Karen will be receiving in New York City the 2023 Entrepreneurial of the Year Award from International PR News, recognizing her as one of the top entrepreneurs in the public affairs industry. And one fun fact about Karen is that she is a world traveler. This summer, she and her husband Richard, who is also a member of our club, will be visiting their 100th country, Madagascar. Welcome, Karen. And now we have Steve Llewellyn. Steve is a native Floridian and a retired Marine Colonel. His career spanned over 30 years, including global assignments to include Iraq and Afghanistan. Following his distinguished career, he worked for the Department of Children and Families and as Director of Education and was later sent by then Secretary Poppel to run the Florida State Hospital at the height of the pandemic. He attended the University of Florida and was a member of Alpha Tau Omega fraternity. He graduated from Florida State University and he holds a Master's of Public Administration from Old Dominion. And one fun fact about Steve is he is the great grandson of Hayes Lewis of Mariana, Florida, who served in the Florida Senate from 1929 until his death in 1935. Welcome, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. And now we have Barney Bishop. Barney is the past chairman of the Economic Club of Florida and is president and CEO of Bishop Consulting. He's a native-born Floridian and an Eagle Scout, and I think tonight you're gonna to be at the Boy Scout event, that's right. And a serial entrepreneur, Barney has been a registered lobbyist for more than four decades and previously served as president and CEO of Associated Industries of Florida. Barney has a long track record of community service, has served on many boards, and I wish to give him a special thank you because it's because of Barney that we got his friend, the Honorable Tom Grady, here today as our keynote speaker. So thank you, Barney. And then finally, we have Dr. Susan Fiorito, Dean of the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship, and she's the Jim Moran Professor and Entrepreneur in Residence. Dr. Ferrito has been with FSU for 33 years, and in addition to teaching at FSU, she's taught and conducted research at the University of Iowa, Florida International University, and the University of Stirling in Scotland. She has received three teaching awards and was selected to be one of the inaugural Jim Moran Institute Faculty Fellows. One fun fact about Susan is she's one of seven children in her family and she's a gifted seamstress. For many years, she meticulously made all the clothes from her family until she got too busy doing her day job. <laughs> yeah. 
And now I will invite our past chair, Barney Bishop, to please introduce our featured speaker. Thank you, Madam President. It's my distinct honor to introduce a longtime friend and someone who I, has, who I have always admired, Tom Grady. Our speaker is a former member of the Florida House of Representatives, where he served for two years is a former Florida Banking Commissioner where he served for two years, and then he served as the interim president and CEO for Citizens Insurance Company for one year. Although it may seem that Tom can't keep a job, Tom is actually a Renaissance man, someone who is skilled in all of the tasks he attempts while becoming an expert in many wide-ranging fields. Winston Churchill perhaps summed it up best when he said, quote, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we get uh, by what we give. Let me say that again. Get it right. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Tom gives back every day through his philanthropic endeavors and his consistent and voluminous service to it seems just about every nonprofit in the finance or education that asks for his counsel and service. You can see by reading his biography that he is very bright, he's intellectually curious, he's a well-rounded individual, but perhaps most importantly, he has a heart of gold. I won't recite his resume for you because it's on your table, but suffice to say that someone who has dedicated his life to making our society better by helping others that is less than fortunate is truly a noble cause. A graduate of Florida State University where he graduated summa cum laude with a degree in business administration and then on to Duke University Law School where he graduated with distinction, Tom's intellect has never been questioned. Since college, he has persevered to help others, whether it is helping veterans with their health care or committing his time and resources to helping children obtain an education and the necessary life skills that are right for them irrespective of whether it's college or a trade, because he believes that every child has potential. And his goal has been to make sure that they have every opportunity, every chance to succeed. As a consequence, just for one of the educational organizations that Tom has worked for, he has helped to raise over $32 million, which is just truly amazing. He's also been a longtime sponsor of Governor Jeb Bush's Florida Celebration of Reading as co-chair of the statewide host committee, which became part of the mission of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. He has also played at the highest levels of government and was appointed to the once in a decade Florida Constitution Revision Commission by then Governor Rick Scott in 2018 as they worked to revamp the state's constitution. He is the current CEO of four businesses, ranging from his financial industry-centric law firm to private equity and real estate development, to venture capital, to creating a bricks and mortar school that since the mid-1990s teaches life skills and provides career opportunities to also managing his own family foundation. Tom is a man who gives of his talents and expects little in return, except for the satisfaction that he receives in seeing others excel. He and his wife, Anne, are longtime residents of Naples, and they are loving parents and grandparents. I'll close with one more quote, this time from former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who, like Tom, recognized that the next generation of Americans need not be coddled but to be challenged in every way possible. And the quote is, we pay a price when we deprive children of the exposure to the values, principles, and education they need to make them good citizens. Let's give Tom a warm economic club welcome. Well, I know when, you know, quit when you're ahead, right? 
doesn't get any better than that. Thank you, Barney. I do want to make one correction, and I could make many. My wife questions my intellect daily. So that probably goes with most of the things that you said. And also, just as a point of order, I believe there is one other interloper guest in here who did not rise when Marion was asking for those persons to do so. And his name is Stuart Brown, who's hiding in the corner over there. I don't think Stuart's a member of the organization. I could be wrong, but Stuart Brown was. <laughs> Welcome, Stuart. A long, long time ago in a galaxy far away, I was a student across Tennessee over here, and he was my finance professor when, what, a freshman, I think. I was only here two years. So anyway, well, welcome, Professor. And I'm glad I'm not following you again, Ken. You always raise the ante. It makes, make, makes it hard, man. The pressure's on if I got to follow you. So I want to open with something in the form of a question to you, Barney, and that is, are you a gambler? No. Anybody up here a gambler? Blackjack? Poker? Slots? Maybe. How about lottery tickets? Lottery tickets. All right. How about in the audience? We have gamblers out in the audience. Wow. Not very many. Okay. How many people have bought cryptocurrency? Boy, this is this one. Would you please stand? No, I'm just kidding. This is un, this, this is an unusual group. You guys are really smart. You can call me a crypt. You can call me a crypto skeptic, as you'll find from from the uh, from the remarks I'm going to share today. But uh, one of the headlines over the weekend was last week in Britain, they made a decision to regulate cryptocurrency the same way they regulate gambling. So I thought that was kind of a fun fact. And in, in the US, there's a, a, a big disagreement on whether it's regulated and how it's regulated. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit in my remarks. But another headline just this morning was 2.6% unemployment in the state of Florida. 2.6%. Now I'm looking around the room, I am older than most, not as old as some. I don't remember 2.6% ever anywhere in the history of America. So why is that relevant to a talk that's supposed to discuss kids, crypto banks, and excellence? I think all of these things are tied together with one theme, and it's a very important theme for America in 2023 and 2024, and that is economic growth. We must have economic growth in America in order to meet our obligations and we haven't had economic growth in America for a long time. I should probably call on Ash Williams to give me the proper statistics, but I think since the great financial crisis, which is when he assumed the reins at the SBA, the perfect timing to have a wonderful record uh, at the State Board of Administration, the GDP for America from roughly 2008-9 to the present is about 0.5% per year on average, half a percent a year. Now, what would you guess the GDP was, growth domestic product rate of growth, between 1929 and 1941. Obviously, those are the Depression years. Would you think that they're more or less? Is the rate of growth higher or lower in the Depression than in the last 15 years? All those who think it would be lower than in the last 15 years, raise your hand. OK, you're all very timid. You're not raising your hands very high. I think probably more <laughs> of you, I think more of you think it would be lower. It was almost 3% a year. 3% a year during the Depression. How can that be? This is, we, we have stories. Every one of us has stories if our ancestors were here in this country during the 1930s. The reason that that was such a stellar rate of growth relative to where we are now is that back then you had something called bankruptcies. They were hard. Farm failures and business failures, very hard on the fabric of America, but it results in excellence rising to the top. Those who couldn't compete didn't. They failed, they were gone. The businesses, the banks, the farms, if they couldn't compete, they were gone. And those who were left competed vigorously. And we need that kind of vigorous competition and that kind of excellence rising to the top today. So I want to talk about capitalism because in America, we have a form of capitalism. And there are two kinds, two pieces of capital that I think of, I think most people probably would too. One is financial, money, think of capital, you know, capital in a bank, money. The other is intellectual capital. It's what we have, it's what we develop, it's what we grow into, it's what we are taught. And frequently it's what we are born with and what our parents choose to leave with us. That intellectual capital is really important, which obviously is the, the part of the kid conversation that I want to get to today. But I want to talk about banks for just a minute, the financial piece. So banks have been in the news, there have been four big bank failures in the U.S. in the last two months, since, let's say, March 8th-ish. And 
people are, some people are very concerned, a lot of people are concerned about what does that portend? Is this the beginning of a trend? Is it a one-off? Should we be concerned about it? In 2023, the banks failed for reasons different than in 2009, 10, 11, 12. When I was the commissioner of the Office of Financial Regulation, every Friday, I signed orders closing banks. It's not a fun thing to do. Banks have customers, banks have employees. Some of these banks were generations old, family banks, community banks. That's not happening now. Back then, 2009, 10, 11, the problem was the balance sheet. There were lousy assets on the balance sheet of a bank. We can talk about why that was, but there were lousy assets. That's a problem, but you can only be a zombie bank for so long with lousy assets. Today, it's different. These banks that failed, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, they had a really good balance sheet in terms of credit quality. Credit quality, very different than 08, 09, and, and 10. Credit quality was good. In fact, the reason Silicon Valley Bank in particular failed was because they invested too much in the safest instrument in the world, which is called a United States Treasury bond. How can a bank fail when it invests in the safest instruments in the world? Well, there's something called interest rate risk that you cannot get around, sometimes called duration risk. That risk was present in a big way, and that caused them to fail. There's another reason they failed. They had a boatload of these long-dated treasuries that declined precipitously in value as interest rates increase. That's what happens. Interest rates go up. If you're holding a security that's guaranteed to pay 1% and interest rates are 5%, you're less willing to pay up for that security. So that's what happened they probably could have muddled through except for this this it takes seconds to transfer your money out of a bank now you go back to the 1930s and you got your suitcases or your whatever you would carry things you'd, you'd go get cash from a bank if you could before the bank failed on the morning of march 9th silicon valley bank 43 billion dollars was transferred out of the bank because of this you know, there aren't very many businesses can, that can withstand that. So why would Silicon Valley Bank, which was the premier bank in the world dealing with startup companies and organizations, and Silicon Valley, for all of California's flaws, is the best place in the world to start a startup organization and start a business. Silicon Valley had an extraordinary franchise, lost it in a day because they didn't manage the interest rate risk, or you could say they were gullible. Why would I say they were gullible? Well, the chairman of our Federal Reserve assured the American people in 2020 and 2021 that there is no inflation, there will be no inflation. Don't worry about it. Mm, things started to tick up a little bit, inflation picked up a little bit. They continued to assure us, and I assume that Silicon Valley Bank board members and CEOs and, and C-suite members would assume the same thing. Powell assured Congress after all. This is, what's the word? Transitory. Became a, we hadn't used the word before. I hadn't heard, used the word, heard the word used much as jargon in the financial industry. Inflation is transitory. Well, if you believe that, if you believe your government, if you believe the Federal Reserve, why not buy long bonds guaranteed to pay you back at the interest rate stated on the bonds? So they did. They bought a slug of them. Turns out Jerome Powell was wrong. Maybe he was misinformed, maybe he genuinely thought it was transitory, maybe it was purely political, maybe it was theater. I don't know, but the banks bought a slug and the banks failed. We do know during the time period that interest rates were rising because inflation was increasing, is that the Federal Reserve had created enormous additional burdens on banks to comply with ESG requirements, to comply with diversity, inclusion, and equity requirements, all of which take a lot of time and suck a lot of energy and a lot of money out of businesses. And you may think they're for very good purposes. We'll put that aside for a moment, whether it serves a good purpose or not. It's time consuming, and that's what the auditors were concerned about. That's what the examiners were concerned about. They didn't come into Silicon Valley Bank and say, whoa, you got a whole slug of these long dated bonds. You need to do something. Are you hedging that risk? Why aren't you selling the portfolio? They didn't do that, but they were paying attention to these other social factors. Also new and different in 2023 compared to prior periods going all the way back to the beginning of banking is that we have more than ever before non-banks competing with banks. So once again, I'll hold up the phone. Anybody in the room ever bought a car and financed it with a couple of clicks on their phone? Not this crowd. I'm beginning to get, get a sense, Barney, of 
of, of, of this, this, this crowd. Okay, let me explain this to you. You can pick up your phone, download an app, and you can buy a car, you can buy a house, you can buy anything you want, and never walk into a bank. My kids, to my knowledge, have never been in a bank, except the First National Bank in Naples, which had cookies. So they went into the bank to get cookies, but they've never been in a bank to bank. So banking is changing, and I'm, uh, there, that, that's a whole different conversation, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, um, other than to point out that there is just a huge disruption in the banking industry, and non-bank lenders are, are part of that. Crypto, that none of you have bought, apparently, or none of you are willing to admit buying, is also a part of that, because three of the four banks that failed this year had some involvement, and some of them had very significant involvement with crypto. So what is crypto? Why were the banks involved? Well, startup businesses are dealing in crypto and they want to bank startup businesses and they want to bank the financiers of the startup businesses who have a lot of money. There's a lot of, a lot of good reasons. There's risk in everything. There's a lot of good reason to do that and to bank these companies. But the UK, as I said, now has classified this as essentially a gambling activity and they're going to regulate it as a gambling activity. But what is it? I guess I won't ask this crowd to answer that question, uh, but it's software. That's all it is. Cryptocurrency is software. It's a ledger. Any, this is a question you will all be able to answer yes, I think. Has anyone ever heard of an Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> Yay, okay. All right, we got it. We got it. Crypto is a spreadsheet. It's a ledger on a blockchain. It's a distributed ledger on a blockchain. And the proponents of crypto tell us that's a wonderful thing. And because it's blockchain, it's assured, unlike US dollars, you can never inflate it. You can never make more Bitcoin. Truth is, you can make an endless amount, and people have made an endless amount of cryptocurrencies, thousands of them, all of them worth pennies on the dollar from when they were first offered. But Bitcoin, they say, is different. There will never be more Bitcoins. Well, you can call me a skeptic. It's software. Has anybody, uh, I, I, spoke, I know the answer to this, so I'm cheating a little bit. I, I know at least one person knows what hack means. Has anyone ever had a bank account or a crypto or securities account hacked? All right, how about a Facebook account? Oh, good grief. All right, well, there's this thing called hacking. And, and this is gonna take a long time, Barney. You, you, you can get something that's online in your world hacked. And once it's hacked, people take something. Maybe it's money, maybe it's a photo, maybe they leave a photo that you don't want them to leave. That's hacking, okay? I am just not going to be persuaded that someone cannot hack into a Bitcoin account or a Bitcoin ledger that was invented by a ghost. We don't know who it is, there's supposedly a name, but the guys never come up and said, hey, I did this. It, it, this the whole thing is, is, is to me smoke and mirrors, but there's a better expression. It's a guy named Dr. Rubini, he's a professor at um, NYU, College of Business. Not quite the same reputation as the Florida State College of Business, but close. So NYU, Pro Professor Rubini said he came up with the seven C's of crypto, and they are corrupt, concealed, crooks, criminal, con men, carnival barkers, and CZ. <laughs> anybody know who C, I know the answer to this question, but has, does anybody here know who's, who or what CZ is? Okay, CZ is the president of a company called Binance. I won't ask. Binance is a crypto exchange operator based in China, like most, uh, like most things. I'll just leave it at that. And CZ was included in this list, even though, like a panel as, as we have here, Rubini was on a panel, CZ was on the panel, and he still said, here are the seven Cs of crypto, while CZ's <laughs> seated at his, at his left. Um, and, and it's funny because three of the four banks, as I say, had a significant involvement with crypto and failed, and yet the proponents of crypto continue to say that crypto is the salvation for finance. It's decentralized, they say. What does that mean? Well, for this crowd, it's unimportant. I won't explain what decentralization is or what centralization is. But it doesn't seem to make any sense to me if crypto is going to be the salvation and 75% of the banks that have failed this year failed because of a connection with crypto. And crypto companies need banks. Okay, so crypto somehow is a salvation, but crypto can't operate without banks. It just, none of it makes sense. But I could be wrong because there are a couple of countries that have wholeheartedly dove in to crypto and, and one country has even, 
adopted crypto, adopted Bitcoin as its legal tender. Maybe we should follow the lead of those countries. They may be right. I won't ask if anyone knows who they are. I will tell you. One is Bhutan. Does anyone know where that is? Right next to Nepal. Okay, good. Thank, thank you. Good. You get a, you get a gold star. Um, El Salvador, closer to home, which made it legal tender. And the Central African Republic. So maybe they got something right. Of course, all of these countries have histories of hyperinflation. They've never had a meaningful, stable currency. It might be better for them. I'd rather gamble with Bitcoin than gamble with whatever the dollar equivalent is in the Central African Republic. So maybe it makes sense for them to gamble, but I don't want to do it. The largest holders of crypto in the world. China and Bulgaria. Seems odd, right? China and Bulgaria. China has outlawed crypto. But China has a, a, a lot of, well, I should say most countries have criminal problems, crime problems. China is not an exception. China has crime problems. Some of that crime involves cryptocurrency problems, cryptocurrency extortion threats. China has less, I dare say, no due process for those who are accused of a crime. So China takes it. If somebody's involved in crypto and they, in China says they wake, you know, whoever's making the decision, I guess it's all the way at the top. When they wake up one morning, they say, you know, you're a crook, give me your crypto. It's gone and it goes into the vaults of China. China owns 5% of the Bitcoin in the, in the world. Bitcoin is very thinly traded. It means there aren't, it's not, not a lot of transactions. If China woke up and said, we're selling Bitcoin, it goes to zero or close to zero just because of the liquidity market. Bulgaria, known for criminal element, mob element, so same reason. They own a lot of criminal because, or a lot of the uh, crypto because apparently there are a lot of criminals or they just allege that there are a lot of criminals. So I want to move into intellectual capital. Financial capital is interesting, it's being disrupted. Intellectual capital is also being disrupted. How we learn, what we learn, who we learn from. It's really exciting, as, as you pointed out, Barney, thank you. I was the chairman of the State Board of Education for the last two years. I was on that board for eight years plus. Loved every minute of it. During the COVID years, enjoyed it because I felt it was so important. It was really challenging. It was difficult to meet. It was difficult dealing with people who felt very sincerely as far apart as you could possibly imagine on something that we would normally think is a fairly simple topic like a mask. I won't bog down the conversation with talking about masks other than to point out it was hotly disputed whether it helped, whether you should wear it, whether we could force someone to wear it consistent with the laws and the Constitution in the United States. Those were trying times. I, th I think on, your, on the table there's a handout. Did, did that make it? Um, okay, so on, on the table I, I, had a, I wrote a letter to Governor DeSantis when my term expired in March. And I won't repeat everything that's in there. I'll just summarize it very quickly to say that the performance of Florida students during my tenure on the board, and I'm not taking credit for that, but during my tenure on the board improved dramatically. The number of failed schools was reduced to nearly none, not none, nearly none. The performance of kids on standard tests increased across the board, all subgroups. And we have different categories. They are racial, they are ethnic, they are economic. And across all categories, the performance improved. Then you can turn to spring of 2020 and the government closures and government takeovers and the onset of COVID, we really shown. And that continues to today. There were statistics that have been released this year about how our kids have performed on, on the, what's called the NAEP, which is a, a national test where you can compare performance of students across the, across the entire country. And Florida was, was better than any large state. And that's important because large states have very diverse populations and, and require a lot of different kinds of teaching methodologies in order to allow all kids to succeed. Florida's on the top. You got to dig way down to the bottom to find the blue states. I know this is an apolitical, I shouldn't say apolitical, nonpartisan group, but it is factually true. If you look at the large blue states that shut down the schools, in some cases as much as two years, those kids lost so much. Online learning did nothing for them. They will never recover unless they happen to be wealthy. If you were wealthy, you were fine. 
You got a tutor, you went to a private school because they stayed open, you created little pods, you got together with the moms and dads in the neighborhoods and your kids went to school and they were fine. If you're a poor kid and you stayed at home, your mom's at work, maybe your dad's at home, maybe your dad's not at home, maybe you don't have a dad at home, they'll never recover. Tragic, they will never recover. That did not happen in Florida. We should be proud of the Department of Education and Governor DeSantis and the State Board of Education for keeping these schools open. We will continue to read about this certainly for my lifetime and probably for the lifetime of my kids and my grandkids because we will see that much of an impact. What does that have to do with capitalism, finance, and money? If, if you look at learning and skills and the acquisition of skills at a macro level, at a GDP level, at a very top level, if we as workers, as contributors to the economy, don't do a good job, we don't get economic growth. If our kids don't excel as a country, we won't get economic growth. We compete in a global economy. We compete with kids in China who I'm told go to school seven days a week, 22 hours a day. I think that's almost true. They cheat differently in Asia, and we just shut down our schools. We're going to feel that, and that's going to have an economic impact. And I brought this up. It's just the Pensions and Investment Magazine. I think there's probably one or two people in the room who subscribe to it. Pensions. There are a lot of aging people in the U.S. There are a lot of people dependent on Social Security. There are a lot of people dependent on the Florida Retirement System, which is in the best shape, thanks to Ash and the legislature and Governor Scott and Governor DeSantis, of any large state pension system in the U.S., how long will that last without economic growth? Without economic growth, it means we're borrowing in order to pay virtually all of these so-called discretionary items in the, in the federal government budget. We need high growth. We need excellence in education. We need merit-based learning and rewards for our kids. And we don't always get that. In Florida, we do. I want to turn to what is typically considered a culture war topic, but not for purposes of engaging in culture wars. But before I do, just anecdotally, I want to share with you that it was a very dangerous job that I had being chairman of the State Board of Education. I had legitimate death threats that were investigated by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement by people who felt that schools should be closed or schools should be open. There was no way to win. They were legitimate death threats. That never happened to me as a state representative, probably will never happen to me, hopefully will never happen to me again. But you really get to focus on priorities when you have people who are this uh, malintended based on your decisions and your judgment and what you're doing that is done, at least in my case, for the best interests of, of kids. You know, I always had as my filter on the state board what's best for the kids. Adults, teachers are great, and, and Florida's teachers are great, and we've begun finally to pay them as great employees, but they're adults and they can communicate their concerns, and they have, in many instances, union representatives that can communicate their concerns. Kids don't have unions. So that was my focal point, is what's best for the kids? So we had the death threats. Then in the summer of 2021, I don't remember how many, but there were four, five, six, seven lawsuits, you would have read about them, most of them were here in Tallahassee, between the state of Florida and the Biden administration. Over, schools open, schools not open, mask mandates, no mask mandates. And it doesn't matter where you fall on that spectrum, whether you thought it was good to be open or not good to be open, there was a lot of litigation, it was very contentious. And I, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal in August of 2021, it's very short. I said, in, in, in COVID anxiety and fear of the base, which was an article by Peggy Noonan, she wrote, it is reasonable that any power to mandate masks comes from the power closest to the voters, local government. No federal power should tell them they must. No governor should tell them they can't. That was a quote. Then my contribution, Ms. Noonan got it half right. No government, federal or state, should tell voters they must or cannot wear masks, but no government can hold the power closest to the voters. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis did not grant the power to mandate masks to any government. He left that power where it belongs, with the people. This did not go over well in Washington. 
And about two weeks later, I was served with a letter from the Department of Justice telling me they were going to charge me with a crime. Building permit. On behalf of a client that I represented that hired a contractor approved by the federal government that got 54 permits on a project. Totally bogus and manufactured. And they said, if you don't make a deal and pay us a million dollars and admit that you're a crook, we're going to file these charges. You don't take that lightly. You know, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably a divergence of opinion on the merits of the prosecution of Donald Trump. And it's easy to say, I don't like him, who cares? You should care. Prosecutorial misconduct is a real problem. There's extraordinary discretion with these prosecutors. So he said, make, let's make a deal or we'll go to trial. And I said, go to trial. I actually had a trial in December of 2021. Government. It was the strangest, I'm a lawyer, I've, I've been in a lot of trials. It was the strangest thing that I've ever experienced. The government for three days essentially said that I did a great job as a lawyer in this transaction uh, and that somehow I'm still responsible for violating the law. We put on no witnesses, none, nothing. We, when the government ended, we ended. And if your lawyer's in the room, you know, that's a big deal. You're like, you're so confident that there's nothing there. You say, we don't need to do anything. The jury went out, came back, you know, not guilty, innocent. I share that with you because that's a symptom, maybe it's a cause and a symptom, of, of, of where we are in a country and our ability to communicate or our lack of ability to communicate, partisan or nonpartisan, that communication skills are a problem. But I'm going to dive in for my, my last zero minutes uh, and, and talk about woke policies, DIE policies, in connection with money and the economy and economic growth. By definition, woke policies, which I would say include diversity, inclusion, equity issues, meaning everyone should have the same result. Different inputs, different kids, different circumstances, but everyone should have the same outcome. Not everyone has the same opportunities, but everyone has the same outcome they are strangling excellence and merit in America. I'll give you some examples. It's not, not simply a culture war when California's Department of Education, the equivalent of what I served on, the State Board of Education in Florida, says that we're going to henceforth not have upper level math courses in our high schools. Think of the engineers produced in California. Think of the engineers working in California in Silicon Valley. And in their wisdom, this board said no more. Why? It's not, I want to say not equitable, but the word is always equity. It's inconsistent with equity. Some kids can't take those advanced level math courses and they feel bad. So it's not fair for other kids who can take those courses to take them and make these other kids feel bad, so we will eliminate the courses. Now I think that is a horrible decision, a horrible impact on kids, and a horrible impact on our longer term future at a high level because if we don't have those kids learning math and we don't have those kids becoming engineers, where are the engineers going to come from? Outside the U.S., that's for sure, and a whole boatload will come from China and Florida, which is good because we don't have these policies in Florida, but as a country we need to focus on excellence, not just here in Florida where we're doing a good job, but in the country. Another example. These blue states are closing schools that are public schools that were established for gifted kids. It's a very good, well-known school in New York, very good, well-known school in San Francisco. For years, forever, since inception, you got in by application, just like a college. They looked at your skill set and said, yes, you can handle the academic rigor that we will impose on you here in this high school. Now, that's not equity, folks. A lot of people can't get in. The lottery would be a lot more fair. We'll just have a lottery so that everyone has an opportunity to get in regardless of whether or not they can actually do the work when they get in. Now if they keep the rigor of the academic program, it's unfair to kids who can't perform at that level to be admitted to those schools. If they dumb down the excellence in those programs, which is more likely what they will do, it's unfair to everyone. It's unfair to the smart kids. It's unfair to the kids who are less capable. It's unfair to us because it affects our gross domestic product. It affects our ability to produce. It affects our, our ability to have a prosperous economy. And we need economic growth. 
So one last example, and that is SAT tests. Does anyone know why they were first adopted back in the 50s and 60s? They were adopted in order to combat socioeconomic, probably primarily, but also frequently people of color were most affected. If you were a kid in the 50s or 60s and you were in an inner city school and you weren't learning very much, or in the 50s you might have been in a segregated school, in the 60s you might have been in a segregated school, they were not separate, they, they were separate but they were not equal, what chance does that kid have to get into Harvard? Not that I would want my child to go to Harvard today, but if that was a goal, how do you get in? You got grades, maybe they're good, maybe they're not, from a school that doesn't even register. You take a test and you show that you're really smart. You've got innate capabilities that are undiscovered. You take the SAT test, you got a lousy school, you got lousy grades, you get in. Fast forward to today. Colleges don't want SAT test scores anymore. Why? Because they want to discriminate on the basis of race. They want to admit students on the basis of race over the competency and capability of those kids. You'll see this in the Harvard decision that's going to come from the Supreme Court sometime this year, I predict. SAT test is really great evidence of discrimination, so let's get rid of it. And then we can discriminate however we want, and we won't get caught. That's not a good way to develop. But in Florida, the good news, as I say, is we're not doing that. HB1, recent legislation. HB1 is going to allow an extraordinary ramping up of competition between schools in the state of Florida. You probably all know of HB1. It was in the news here locally again today. It's been in the news a lot. And HB1 essentially gives money, vouchers, to everyone. Pick your own school. What's important to you as a parent? Do you want to go to a parochial school? Do you want to go to a private school? Do you want to stay with your public school? Do you want to go to a public charter school? Transportation dollars are included too. Parents get to choose with their kids. They get to choose where they're going to school. There will be some disruption here. There will be some schools that will fail. There will be a lot of schools that will open up and they have immediate accountability to parents because the parents can say, okay, I didn't like how my kids were dealt with this year. Next year, we're going somewhere else. So if you don't do a good job, you're going to be gone. Just like those businesses in the Depression era, just like America was before the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Do a great job, you will excel, your kids will excel. This will cause a tremendous improvement in the level of excellence in our schools in Florida and a dramatic improvement in the skill set and capabilities of the kids going to school in Florida. You get to choose as parents or, in my case, as grandparents. You know, I have a, a grandson, Jesse, who's 13. I have a granddaughter who's five and a granddaughter who's two and another one coming. The biggest challenge that lack of economic growth poses is to them. We will do fine in this room. There's enough runway in the USA to borrow more for a while, but we got to get this right, and it comes with excellence. So having this radical choice of schools is a terrific idea. I did want to talk about, but I won't because I'm now out of time, uh, a school, sort of a school, a homeschool support system in Collier County that is called the Freedom Institute. And you can look it up, freedomhomeschools.com. It is taking advantage of, although it was, it was created prior to HB1, it will benefit from HB1. And we're creating an, an environment that's different than many other schools and that we're focusing on five C's, not seven, as Dr. Rubini uh, was, was mentioning, and, and it includes career counseling, civics, core competency. We want kids to graduate from high school knowing a lot about their country, knowing a lot about history, knowing a lot about consumerism, personal finance, home economics. We want kids to graduate from college fully capable of becoming employees, not having to go to college because they haven't yet learned how to do anything else. Not anti-college, but opening up opportunities for kids that they may not have now and having internships and apprenticeships and real jobs. So that's probably the subject of a, of a totally different conversation. I'm, I'm gonna close with um, just a, a summary about capital flows. You know, capital flows to areas where it's treated well. Capital has poured into Florida in the recent years in the form of wealthy people, successful businesses, and smart people. Intellectual capital is coming to Florida too, and we are home brewing intellectual capital in the state of Florida. People coming here, they're coming here because they still believe in the American dream and they want their kids, they want their families to be successful. Uh, I want to show, I, I didn't bring, as you saw, I didn't have a PowerPoint or anything of that sort. I do have one picture that I'd like to throw up on the screen. 
that it for everybody to look at. And I will, I will end with this last picture. That's not it. There we go. Okay, so you can all see that on the left-hand side is a boat that looks like a Coast Guard type boat, it is. And then on the right-hand side, you have a plywood hexagon, it looks like, boat. No motor, no oars, no paddle, no water, no food, 12 people. What are these 12 people doing out on the water? I mean, I saw this photo, I just, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little out of place in this conversation, maybe, but it, it ties into excellence and the American dream and a meritocracy. These people are so eager to come to the United States to secure, as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution say, the blessings of liberty, that they're gonna get in this boat and travel the Straits of Florida to try to get to Florida, to try to land on Florida so that they can have the liberties that we take for granted all too often and get sort of confused when we're fighting between ourselves about things like diversity, inclusion, equity, critical race theory. At the end of the day, kids just need to learn, they need to be smart, they need to be able to compete. These people understand that. Vice President Harris was given the task of handling the border when she was first in office in 2021, and you may have an opinion on whether she did or whether she didn't, I have an opinion. But what, we, what is not opinion, what is fact, is that she said the first thing she wanted to do is study the root cause of immigration. There it is. The blessings of liberty. People want a better life. They want a better job. They want economic growth. They want to participate in the American experience, in the great American ex experiment. And finally, Benjamin Franklin. I know people who want to hear Benjamin Franklin, these old guys, right? 1787, you know, a woman asked him what, what, what he had just done at the Constitutional Convention. He said, well, we have formed a republic if you can keep it. I say let's keep it. It's the greatest experience in the history of the world. Florida's doing a better job than any of the other 50 states. I'm so proud to be a Floridian and so proud to be an American, and thank you very much for having me. I've probably eaten up all my question time, but I'm happy to stay for questions should anyone have any. Thank you. We have time for just a few questions. Does anybody want to ask a question? I do. Okay, Barney. Um, so, what would be your opinion of the Federal Reserve and how they've handled SVB out in Silicon Valley and First Republic in New York? What did they do right? What did they didn't do right? Well, my opinion, and Ash can probably give you a much better explanation, my opinion is they handled it poorly, but that they had no choice. They bailed out Silicon Valley Bank depositors. They did not bail out shareholders. I need, to be, need to be very clear on this. Now, I was a shareholder. I thought it was a well-run banking institution. I had a very low basis in the stock, fortunately, so it wasn't a huge deal for me. But they, they bailed out the depositors, and there was such a micro system, an economic system in the startup world that that, that was, I think, an important thing to do. They had to do it. Why? Because they had been screaming for so long that there are no problems and that you can assume there will be no inflation. You can make some decisions and the Federal Reserve knew for a year that wasn't how it was playing out. So what would they do? Let, let, let the bank fail and then they would be called to task because clearly they, they could have seen this. If, if the bank could have, should have seen it, certainly the Federal Reserve. I think the regulators were asleep on the job. So they were, they were left with no, no, no good choices. Any other questions? I've worn you out. Okay. Nothing. Okay. I don't know what that so, says, but good. On behalf of the Economic Club of Florida, let's give them another hand, please. Thank you. Thank you. And we present you this. You can hang it on your shelf or whatever on behalf of the Economic Club, and we appreciate well, thank you, you and your insight. So thank you. Thank you. And finally, don't forget June 6th, come back to hear Katie, and the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. You can ship that to me if you like. Um, yeah. <laughs>